century had the courage to actually do, which is to talk about things which are not normally talked about, um, which one might describe, roughly speaking, as the role that the social sciences have to say in how we do science and in science itself. And if you were here for his last theory lunch and for the talk that he gave at the retreat, then you know that this is something that's very close to his heart. You might also have noticed a slight tendency in this direction over the course of the last year in some of the other talks we've had, and now that Uri has opened the door for us, we might explore it further next year, and I'm very glad that he's going to come back to us. So I'm not going to stand in your way anymore. I'm just going to hand over to Uri. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming, and um, there's some, uh, my seat here is free, I'm just standing, <laughs> and there's another one there. Uh, how many of you came out from outside of the department? Thank you very much for making the effort to come. You came uh, from my floor. <laughs> it's, still, it's still an effort, across the, the boundaries between the departments. It's not trivial. And, um, Who came from the farthest way away? You came from Israel. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. It's <laughs> Ron's father. There you go. He's here. Who's, uh, does anybody come from outside Boston? From across the river? Cambridge. Cambridge? Across the ocean. Across the ocean? <laughs> Where from? Paris. Paris? <laughs> um, this talk today will have two parts. And the first part, as Jeremy said, is going to be about the um, subjective side of science, or the way of life of science, and how it affects our research and our well-being. And I'll spend uh, some time about this. The second part uh, will be about uh, research, um, about uh, robust, perfect robustness, in cell signaling, in signal transduction. And we'll have a break, <coughs> something between them. And, okay. So, the starting point for talking about the subjective side of science is to think about the ideology of science, the uh, values or con words we think about when we think about what is science. And the ideology that we have in the back of our minds, many of us. The science is objective. It's done with uh, a rational faculty. And a mind that's observing dispassionately, or observing nature. What we know from social science is that when you think about something with these words, it automatically excludes from science our professional thinking about science, the complementary side of humanity. So if this is science, then this is not science. Subjective, emotion, body, and a whole list of other things. If we run the danger of, uh, of ignoring that side. What do I mean ignoring that side? We're all human beings doing science. And we all know that what we love about science has to do with, like Aristotle he said, the two wonders. The wonder of, ah, this is what is there. And the wonder, the second wonder is, ah, this is the answer. How wonderful. These two wonders of science. What we love about science. But when you think about our scientific profession, we spend 10,000 hours learning biology and math and physics. But not one hour, usually, talking about aspects of scientists' life which is here. The practice of science. So it's under the table. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it's not discussed. What are the implications? What does this mean for, for us as scientists working in the scientific profession? I think that um, I would say that a lot of the suffering we see in science, which is roughly 50% of graduate students, although most PIs or uh, no, postdocs are miserable, PIs in the beginning years go through universal, horrible stresses, the period when you're trying to get a job. We all know about these moments of suffering and misery, but we're alone because it's not discussed. In talks, 
there's not a course that goes through our uh, education that talks about these things. So you feel alone. You feel you know you can find maybe friends to talk about it. Now, if it's not discussed, it's not valued. It's not valued in our profession. For example, how good a mentor you are. How many postdoc slides you burned in order to get a result. <laughs> Doesn't matter for promotion or for getting grants in most places. Not, not universally, right? In most places. It's not valued in our profession. So if my thesis is, my thesis, it's not my thesis that I, I love. It's not the thesis I discovered. This was discussed already since the 70s, at least, by people like Evelyn Fox Keller. The thesis is that adding discussion <coughs> in our profession of these subjective aspects of science will greatly improve our well-being and the quality of our science. It's not one against the other. So I think it's also perceived, if you just think about the objective side, that nurturing, let's say the word something with nurturing, is every hour you spend nurturing your students is an hour you spend not doing science. Lab retreat. But uh, is this really so? Worry that uh, dichotomy you set up there is not something that's just emerged, it's actually been deliberately constructed by, by scientists themselves. That's a great question. Uh, constructs like this. <laughs> In my opinion, the way I look at it is <coughs> science has room for many, many different kinds of people. Some people so, mentoring will never, never, never be like great at human relations. <laughs> Other people are naturally gifted at it. Most people are affected very much by the culture they live in. And if there's a vacuum, not discussed, then you pick up values that are floating around in the scientific culture and in the larger Western culture around. And my Speaking now, I'm talking to this majority of scientists because I think discussion just makes you th see different options and styles and think more about the way you choose to do things. Because in my opinion, um, science needs a cultural change. It's not something like a big revolution. It's an education change, a val value change. Because I, I've been through myself a lot of misery in my scientific career. It didn't come because experiments didn't work. It had to do with human relations, not knowing, nobody told me how to mentor, nobody told me how to choose students, nobody told me this, what's going on in interactions between people who are in a, in a community that's trying to go from the known to the unknown, a very special community. So it's constructed a little bit because a lot of, uh, it's just ignored, I would say, it's the main problem. Now, uh, just, w just to say uh, something, uh, I'm going to talk about something very specific today. Uh, this is like the third, let's say, in a series of talks like uh, Jeremy mentioned that I want to do to explore these sides because many, many things to talk about. I've talked about how to choose a scientific problem in the retreat. I mean, how many, many people were at my talk at the retreat? About half, maybe. So how to choose a scientific problem? It's a highly subjective thing that has to do with listening to your own voice. What, what do you find interesting, etc. Right? Not going for the first problem. If you think about this, we have to produce. One week after in the lab, I want to see results. You choose the first problem. Your postdoc already is in a bad path because you haven't thought about the problem that's right for you and that's the easiest to do. Okay, so that's just thinking about it a little bit. And many, many postdocs I've seen, uh, just a uh, loss of human potential, I would say, because this side isn't thought about. And I'm not trying to criticize uh, mentors, because I made these mistakes myself. I just want to open it for discussion. Today we'll talk about a different, very specific topic that you can derive from this, you can say. <laughs> <laughs>